Okay, welcome to Brick Geometry and Snot Building. My name is Bill Ward, and I'm gonna go through some of the techniques behind the models you see on the screen here, as well as some other things too. Um, we're gonna talk about the size and relationships between sizes of Lego elements. Uh, so I'm sure everyone starts off knowing this, you have three plates to a brick. Um, but of course it gets a lot more complicated than that. So. If you measure the diameter of a stud, the height of a brick, the width of a brick, and you wanna to try to make everything work out, you're gonna quickly find yourself scratching your head with all of the math. So to try to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to tell you about a different measuring unit called the LDU. Uh, this stands for LDRAW unit. It is the basic measuring size of LDRAW, which is also the basis of the studio system in BrickLink. So uh, a stud is five millimeters, but if you make it be 12 LDU and you make the brick be 20 instead of eight millimeters and you make the height be 24 instead of 9.6, uh, the math is a lot easier. Uh, for one thing, um, it's a lot easier to multiply things by 20 um, and it's a lot easier to, uh, uh, to, to figure out the relationships if it's all of integers. So we're gonna use this uh, throughout this presentation to talk about the sizes and relative sizes of parts. Here's the table giving you some units of conversions. I expect you all to have this completely memorized and there will be a quiz at the end. Actually, no, um, but uh, this will tell you if you have uh, any of these units, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, one LDU is uh, 1 20th of a stud, it's 1 24th of the, of the width of a one by one brick. That is 0.4, excuse um, me, four millimeters, not 0.4 millimeters. No, it is 0.4 millimeters because it's a 20th. Yeah, so uh, eight millimeters is a brick um, here. Uh, 24 LDUs is 9.6, um, but 20 is 8.0. So eight millimeters is the width of a one by one brick and the height is 9.6 millimeters. But if you use 20 and 24, everything is an integer. That's the point. So we all know Legos are not square, Lego bricks. I'm trying to embrace the word Legos just to see if I can't get under people's skin more. So Legos are not square. Legos are 9.6 millimeters high and eight millimeters wide. Um, so I hope that made everyone's skin crawl. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the height of five plates is the same as the width of two stud brick. So that's 40 LDU. And that's why a lot of the snot techniques uh, require everything to be uh, an even number of studs. Another useful ratio is the six to five ratio. So if you have the one by six by five panel or, or brick that is square. Um, and if you have a, a stack of five bricks uh, that is equivalent to six studs, 120 LDU in this case. So this works great if you have an even number of studs, right? So if you have six uh, studs, that's five bricks. If you have four studs, that's three bricks on a plate. If you have two studs, that is a brick and two plates, right? But what if you have an odd number of studs? If you have three studs, then you have two bricks, a plate, and a little more. Uh, one stud is equivalent to two plates and a little more. Well, how much is that little more? That little more is a half of a plate. And so how do you get a half of a plate? Answer is brackets. So all of these brackets have a half plate thickness on their vertical portion. So if you use any of these pieces, you can make up that gap. Um, these, these pieces are also brackets. Uh, they're not quite the same dimensions um, and they don't quite work the same way, but uh, uh, you, you can sometimes make them work, but the, the spacing and placement of the stud is not quite right. So let's talk about studs not on top. So the brackets that we've seen, um, is, for example, this yellow one, um, make up for the missing half plate thickness in our uh, wall. So we can have the front face of that tile. For example, if you have one of the printed tiles from our uh, Dia de los Muertos uh, display, then um, you wanna make that flush in your wall, you do this. And that way uh, the, the printing is right flush with the uh, face of the wall. Um, another piece that can be used to place things sideways are snot bricks. 
and it's not bricks have studs on the side. So that could be a, a brick or I also include the, the bottom right hand corner there. There's three that are perhaps more, more likely to be thought of as plates, but they kind of function the same way. So I'm including them here. Uh, you might be tempted to use Technic bricks for these kind of techniques. And that sort of works sometimes, but there is an alignment issue. And uh, here you can see the difference. If you look really close, you will see that <clears throat> the holes are placed a little too high. Uh, the injection molding technology that they had in the 1970s when they came up with the design for the first Technic bricks didn't allow them to have enough space under the tubes for studs on the bricks below. Um, at least that's the party line. And I heard this from Jamie Burrard himself. So um, the reason for this is basically that the, um, the, the designers of Technic, the original Technic bricks, if you were a child in the United States in the 1970s, you might remember it as expert builder. Um, then uh, those bricks, uh, first of all, they didn't have, as these examples do, uh, tubes that align with the studs. They were halfway between two studs. Um, but even then, they still had trouble making space for the stud to insert below. Modern injection molding uses much thinner plastics to get the uh, strength that they need, so they don't really have that problem anymore. Um, but in order to retain compatibility with all of the technique um, that has ever been made, um, we are still stuck with this small error. And uh, so that is why we have bricks with studs on the side. That is the whole reason. Um, so here, if you uh, stack a, these plate with the studs on the side and a brick with studs on the side, those studs will align. So that makes a total height of five. And the location of the studs is such that if you place something across their face, they will connect, as you see here with this transparent yellow plate. So the height of that is five plates, which is, of course, 40 LDU. Now, another way to make things mount flush, um, like you could with your um, Day of the Dead uh, tiles, would be to make your wall be three studs thick, which is kind of uncomfortable, um, and include a brick and a plate along with the tile. So this works, but it's not ideal. It'd be better to do it the other way. Um, but here's an example of something like that in, in effect. In fact, actually, if you were to look at beyond the cropped edge of that photo on the left, you would actually see that that is a Technic uh, brick with studs in it, uh, with the half pins in it, but it's close enough and there's enough wiggle room. It doesn't seem to be a too big of a problem. So the front part of this bus is made of plates that are facing forward. And I'm sure that you have built Lego models of vehicles where they do something similar, where the whole front of the, of the vehicle is studs forward and then attached to some sort of snot piece. So this is one way to do that. You can see from the yellow and black stripes how many studs it is exactly, how many plates thick it is. And then that attaches, and then the uh, grill is flush with the front bumper. Here's another example of my little sheep. Um, no, this is not Sean the sheep, it's just a sheep. But uh, the circled uh, studs on the left-hand side, um, you'll see if you look carefully that those bricks are studs facing outwards. Um, so the, the, the neck piece, the studs are facing forwards. And then the other uh, side pieces, the studs are facing to the sides. And yet, if you place a plate across them, it fits. And that is because of this same uh, calculation that the number of the spacing between those studs is a multiple of 20 LDU and therefore the plates can fit across them nicely. And then the head attaches to the tops of those studs. Um, another trick you can do, which I've done in um, my Lego uh, Caltrain locomotive is to have some panels be deliberately misaligned in this case, I've placed some tiles on a plate and then put that onto a brick with studs on the side. And then that makes those panels actually be a half of a plate set in. And that provides just a little bit of interesting texture. So that the wall of the locomotive is not just a solid black, a solid gray wall, but rather you know, represents some of the little access panels and doors that are there on the real thing. So here's a picture of that. So you can see that uh, in the front, I've got three studs in the back, I've got four studs and those are inset by a little bit and attached the way I just showed on the previous slide. 
Um, so again, that just makes sure that the, the wall of the locomotive is not just totally flat. Um, here's another model that I like to use as an example for some of these techniques. Um, this is a, uh, a guy from the Netherlands named uh, Vincent Kessels. His nickname is Mr. Tomato Bread. And um, I met him at Brick World in Chicago a number of years ago, and he had this model of a historic house in Gouda. And um, there's a few techniques on the face of this house that are uh, kind of interesting from the snot perspective that I'd like to show you. So the first one is this panel across the front. Um, the, the, the medium blue pieces are all bricks and plates uh, mounted sideways. And then the gray pieces are a plate with a, with a rail. And so the way that these are all attached, you can see in the exploded diagram um, that uh, they are attached to a, a bracket piece. And then you have the various plates and uh, bricks and a tile at the end. And then if you build that with uh, you know, the tiles facing the center, you can place those two sections uh, facing each other. And then uh, the number of LDU that it adds up to is equivalent to seven studs. Uh, so the half plate from the bracket plus all of those uh, plates and bricks um, and the tile add up to a total of seven studs and the building is 16 wide. So uh, two of those plus a brick on each end makes 16. Another technique on his building that I wanna show you is the, um, the issue that comes up with jumper plates. So in this example, the building's uh, windows are five uh, bricks, five studs wide and the uh, arches above them <clears throat> are a piece that is six studs wide. Um, and so in order for the uh, arches to be aligned over the windows, you have to use uh, jumper plates. And so if you look carefully, you can see that, that the, um, the section that contains the arches is five plates thick. And uh, if you count the number of studs, it is 15 studs wide. And so in order to make this, um, this fill in this half of a stud here, well, half of a stud is 10 LDU and a plate is, or tile is eight LDU. So there is two LDU missing. And um, you can see visibly that there is an inset there. Um, he decided that's fine because it's an old building. Um, but is it possible to fill that in? Um, I, you know, I've been giving this presentation for, uh, I think 14 years since the first version of this presentation. Um, I'm not sure when I added this particular example, it wasn't at the very beginning of it, but nobody has actually come up with a better solution than what he did, which is to just put in some two by two tiles mounted on snot bricks and call it a day. Um, so uh, this top row of course is jumper plates. And then, so these tiles are mounted on the jumper plates. And then there's a one by one tile here so that it can be 15. Um, this was built a long time ago before the existence of the, um, of the one by three tiles or the one by three jumper plates or a lot of the other newer parts that we have. So this might be built a little differently if it were being designed today, but the problem still exists that there would still be a little gap on the sides and there's really no way around that. But, you know, it's an old historic building. The original building isn't very straight, so it's fine if the Lego model isn't either. Uh, I'm going to get into the headlight brick for a little bit here and talk about some of its powers and abilities. So the headlight brick is a one by one brick that is, instead of being the normal uh, eight millimeters thick, um, it's actually a little thinner. It's, uh, it's missing uh, half of a plate thickness, in fact. And so that yellow uh, stud on the side is um, in system with the gray stud above it, not um, not the same as a brick with a stud on the side would be. Um, the height of the brick, of course, is a normal brick height. Um, so there's a little uh, four by four LDU, uh, I call it a foot, I don't know what else you'd call it, uh, sticking out the bottom or ledge perhaps um, on that brick. And so there's sort of an inset piece that is the same dimensions as the top of the brick. And you can also see that the way the location of this top stud uh, really kisses the edge of this front face. So um, if you take four of these highlight bricks, you can put them together into this, uh, this sort of uh, circular shape. This provides you with a small module that has a stud facing each direction and an anti-stud facing each direction. And that stud and anti-stud are in the same uh, system grid. So if you, that, that little construction can be the core of various uh, building techniques. 
And uh, here's an example of something similar to that. Um, instead of having uh, four headlight bricks in all directions, um, there's a, a panel underneath. And this is taken from the Lego set, uh, from the original uh, Ghostbusters ideas set, where the, um, the, yellow, uh, the yellow bracket, I've, I've changed the colors in my, in my example to make it easier to see how it's built. The yellow bracket is a half a plate thick and the blue headlight bricks have a half of a plate inset. And so the combination of those means that you can place that curved piece on top. And I was so blown away when I built that model. I was like, oh my God, that was just, I mean, I've been building snot for so many years and it just never occurred to me to do that. And it works really well. And you'll see that technique on a lot of the newer sets, especially a lot of the, the larger vehicles. Like if you were to build say the Mustang or the Camaro, um, those kind of building, those kind of models, uh, they'll have some stuff like this along the sides. If you really want to practice uh, snot, I recommend building those cars. I just built the Camaro set recently, and it, it's got some really amazing um, ways of, of making studs go on the side for the side panels, especially. Um, now, a problem you might uh, encounter is you want to have a smooth slope. Well, if you jump up by a whole plate each time, then, you know, it, it's especially if you're doing it with tiles, it can be really jarring. Um, and so you might want to do this where you have got uh, every other plate up by half of a half of a plate height. But how do you attach them? Uh, well, the answer is this. Basically, you take headlight bricks and alternate their orientations. So the two yellow headlight bricks are like in the normal studs up orientation and the two black ones are I guess you'd say studs forward. Um, and that provides you with that difference in gap. And it's very similar to what we just saw with the other thing, except that the black bricks are rotated 180 degrees relative to how you'd make that. If you go back to uh, this example here where you've got um, the four headlight bricks meshed together, if you were to flip that yellow one around 180 degrees, then you would get the same thing as what I'm showing you on this other slide here. Um, and so that gives you that half plate uh, spacing and that give, lets, lets you put those green pieces um, a little bit more smoothly going up that hill. And that's especially uh, helpful when you're dealing with uh, cheese slopes. So these one by one uh, slopes, we call them cheese slopes because they're like wedges of cheese. Uh, they've got a little ledge on the front of them and that little ledge on the front of them, well, it is exactly a half of a plate. If you were to lay a brick on its side and push it up against that model, you'd see that they match perfectly. So what can we do with that? Well, we can use the same technique to make a smooth slope. So in this case, I've got my yellow, three yellow headlight bricks with the middle one rotated like that. And then the slopes on top are smooth. And um, I first saw this technique um, on this model here, which Brom Lombrecht uh, made uh, I probably about 15 years ago now. Um, and he called it the, uh, the Legos Land Space Lines uh, 979. Um, it kind of looks a little bit like a 747 on the nose. And then uh, inside you've got accommodations for passengers. And uh, I've also used the same technique on my, um, my Caltrain locomotive. And so I made a false color version there in the center so you can see how it's done. Um, the headlight bricks are pointing every which way on the left there yellow, blue, and red ones. Um, and the red ones are facing down. Um, and that provides you with the necessary spacing uh, for the, the sloping inward from the front. But also, um, there's also that same kind of smooth slope technique where the interior ones are alternated and staggered as well. So if you look at the photograph on the right, you can see those yellow headlight bricks. And um, at the time, uh, yellow um, headlight bricks were in the pick a brick wall at the uh, Valley Fair store. And that's why I, had so many, I, I, I had a bunch of yellow. So I used yellow for the nose of the locomotive. And you can see how every other stud is sort of inset with a open stud versus uh, at the front with a solid stud. So that shows you how the headlight bricks are alternating there. So it's alternating in two dimensions and that's how you get the slope on the front of the locomotive. Now, of course, we also have the brick with the stud on the side. And that is represented here in red. And you can see it's just a normal one by one brick, um, uh, which has the thickness of 20 LDU as opposed to the depth of the headlight brick, which is only 16. So by using these together, you can also explore the half plate differences in depth. So in this example, this is actually on the facade of my Micropolis hospital. 
Um, and in this example, I'm using the, the light gray bricks are headlight bricks. Um, the dark gray bricks are a regular one by one brick with a stud on the side. And so instead of it being a full stud depth, as we saw with the Ghostbusters thing, it's a half stud depth. Um, and that allows for the pieces that are um, the tan pieces, which are all bricks of stud on the side. There's no tan headlight bricks here. Um, they are all alternating between studs in and studs out. So the studs in go into the underside of the light gray bricks. The studs out go onto the side stud of the dark gray bricks. Um, and But the orientation of the studs on the sides of those tan bricks do line up perfectly for the uh, slopes to be placed on there. Um, and that gives the nice uh, bay window shape that we're going for um, with this model. Uh, now you might also be curious about, well, can I get an even finer um, uh, slope? And yes, you can with a quarter plate offset. So if you think back to Vincent's house where we had that unwanted two LDU gap, well, I can use that two LDU gap deliberately here to make a uh, very, very, very smooth surface. Um, it, it is a bit tricky to uh, provide the infrastructure for it, but once you've built the thing shown in step five, uh, if you can rotate that on its side, you can make maybe a, a, a grassy hill. Um, that's why it's green. Uh, or you could do any number of other sorts of um, creations based on that. So, so if you want a really uh, gently sloping um, hill or, or, or surface of some kind, uh, then using a combination of headlight bricks and uh, bricks with studs on the side and jumper plates and not jumper plates, uh, by all four combinations of those two things um, will give you these four different depths. So uh, the first yellow uh, headlight brick here is this is it, this, uh, this this edge of this uh, green brick is in line with this gray plate. The second one, it is because there's a jumper plate, it is sticking out by two LDU or a quarter of a plate. This next one is a red brick with a stud on the side. And then that gives us a half of a plate difference relative to this one. And then finally, this last one gives a half of a plate distance relative to this one for the same reason. And so that adds up to one, two, three, four uh, bricks to get to the height difference of one plate. So um, if you look carefully at this last one, the blue plate here um, uh, is not quite in system with the gray plate, but the next one in the series would be. So um, that would give you the, the, the full. So this is you know one quarter, two quarters or half, three quarters, and then the next one would be a full plate height if there were a fifth one. So you can, you, by repeating this pattern, you can make any, any size slope you want um, that, it, that goes up by a quarter plate each time. All right, so that's all we got to say about those techniques. Now I want to get into triangles. So first, a little bit of geometry. Um, if you have not studied this in school, well, this is a preview of what you'll get to when you get to geometry. Um, but uh, it is necessary to have some basic understanding of the fact, if, if, if nothing else, the fact that these particular numbers are special. So uh, I'm not going to prove to you the Pythagorean theorem, that's for your math teacher, but I will tell you that what it is, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That means if you look at the red triangle, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, those add up to 25, which is the same as five squared. Um, and similarly for the yellow one, five squared is 25, 12 squared is 144. You add those together, you get 169, which is 13 squared. And I don't remember what 17 squared is, but uh, eight squared plus 15 squared does in fact add up to 17 squared. Uh, there are a few other numbers. You can see seven, 24, 25 would also work. Um, however, almost all times when this is relevantly useful to you is gonna be the three, four, five. Um, because the other ones are all very, very long and pointy and acute. So seven, 24, 25, you can see is even more pointy than the green one is or the yellow one. And uh, they, uh, they, they just get, um, the, 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 they get larger and larger uh, numbers uh, without getting to be you know, more like regular triangles. 
So you might be thinking, well, what about, uh, you know, six, eight, 10? Yes, that does work, but we're talking about uh, if you reduce them down to their, to their minimum factors, this is, this is the truth here. So uh, you can double them. So six, eight, 10 works, uh, nine, 12, 15 works. So basically if you double or triple all the sides, you get a triangle that is uh, in, in mathematical terms similar, uh, meaning that it is all the proportions are the same, but it's larger or smaller. So three, four, five, double it, you get six, eight, 10, double, uh, triple it, you get nine, 12, 15, and so on. So those work. Now, how do you use this in Lego? Well, if you wanna do a three, four, five in Lego, you actually want to do a five, uh, sorry, a four, five, six, instead of three, four, five. And that's because the measurement is from the center of the studs, because that's the pl place where the pivoting happens. So if you look here, I've superimposed an orange triangle on top of these bricks, and you can see that the distance between the center of the studs is three, four, and five, but the length of the parts needed to achieve that is four, five, six. So Basically what that means is you take the desired Pythagoras triangle that you want and add one to each side. So here's some examples of what it would look like if you wanted to make a 5, 12, 13 or an 8, 5, 17, you just add one to each of the sides. And you'll notice that each of these is composed of a number of different plates um, because there, are, there aren't necessarily Lego plates in the sizes you want. But also the fact is that the studs will interfere. So if you look at the uh, blue and uh, uh, blue and yellow plates in this example, the Lego studs would hit the red plate unless you added a spacer. So you're gonna end up with a three plate thick triangle. You can get around this somewhat by using the one by four plate that only has studs on the two ends um, or uh, you know technic designs or some other techniques, but um, if you're just using regular plates or bricks, you're gonna end up with a little bit of a thicker design than you might ideally want. So here's an example of a bridge. This is based around the 6, 8, 10 triangle. It's actually 7, 9, 11. And, and if you look carefully, you'll see that the walls of that bridge are like four or five plates thick. Um, but uh, because each individual piece is only one or two plates thick, it really doesn't look as thick as it actually is. Um, so all I've done is I've taken the three, four, five, and I've just doubled its um, dimensions in each, in each direction. And then I've built um, plates that are the appropriate lengths. So seven, nine, and 11 in this case. Uh, another way to make triangles, they're not exactly triangles. Um, uh, these, are, these are called, a, this is a hypo technique. Um, if you look at this uh, website, uh, uh, l3go.buga.com. Um, I really hope this website stays up forever because it's got a lot of really useful building techniques on it. Um, but basically, if you use a hinge, you can get a bunch of different angles. They're not exactly triangles, but they will often serve the same function as a triangle. And so it's worth considering um, the possibility. You'll notice that basically in each case, uh, the pieces are simply mirror images of each other. And that's why this works for any size because um, the hinge point is just uh, where that mirror image reflects across that diagonal there. So uh, you cannot, uh, you might be thinking, well, why don't I just uh, you know, fold this hinge over and fold this hinge over and connect them up? Well, that'll only work if it is uh, you know, a multiple of three, four, five, or one of those other triangles I showed you. Otherwise it won't quite work. Now, as you might know, Lego often has a little bit of wiggle room and you could sometimes get away with stuff that isn't mathematically perfect. Um, in this particular scenario, it's unlikely um, that you'll be able to do it without stressing the bricks more than you want to, but feel free to try. Another useful technique for getting things at an angle is by swapping the corners. So if you look at the, uh, the, the at these uh, blue and uh, red uh, rectangles that I have in the center of the screen, the red rectangle is rotated a little bit relative to the blue one. They are the same rectangle, um, the same dimensions. Um, and uh, the opposite corners are simply, um, it's, it's, they're simply connected at opposite corners. And so you can do this in Lego too. You just put a stud of the corners and, and put a brick across there. You can even, in this example, I could have a two by two jumper in the center and that would go into the tube on the bottom of the red for an even better connection. And I, um, I use this technique uh, with my, my rainbow apartment building that I built in 2020. Um, actually. 
fun story. I built this during the morning of the Bricks by the Bay online and later that afternoon I showed it off in my mock tour. So this was a, a rush build um, and it's one of the most recent models that I've actually designed. So each, um, if you look at the underside, you can see that it's just one big building that changes colors, but it kind of has the illusion of being uh, six different buildings. And uh, there's only two studs where it attaches. If you look at the base, you can see those two jumper plates in the corner and that's where it attaches. Um, and uh, the, the points where it attaches are offset by uh, three studs and um, you just rotate the whole thing by just a little bit and it lines up with exactly, um, you know, if you look here, you can see that the, the, the corner of each uh, quote unquote building um, is on, right on that line in the tiles. So you can see how it lines up there um, consistently. Another way of doing the swap corner technique is with hinges. Um, this is what's done in a lot of aircraft and spacecraft that need to taper the fuselage gradually. Uh, the place where I first encountered this was in the Sop with Camel set, um, where the side panels of the fuselage were attached with hinges. Um, and it's the same technique because you're just really exchanging the corners. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the, the black plate there, um, the corners of the black plate um, that touch the red tile, the red plates, um, those corners are in fact uh, where the hinge pivot point is. And therefore, um, you, if, you, if you rotate that black plate just a little bit, you would see that it actually um, would be in system. So the number of um, studs difference between where the two hinges go, it must be just two because that's the thickness of the wall that you're angling. Um, is, is, there's, is this difference between the Remember, it's um, so this point here where my mouse cursor is is one stud away from the edge of the gray plate, and then this point over here where my mouse cursor is is two studs over from the edge of the gray plate, and the thickness of the black piece is one stud. So it's if this black piece were to be put straight uh, at a distance of one stud from the edge, you would see that. Instead of this corner of the black plate, it would be this corner of the black plate that touches at that point. And similarly over here, instead of this corner, it would be that corner that touches this corner of the red plate. So if you put this thing parallel to the gray you, at one stud in from the edge, this it would still touch the red plates at two corners, but it would be a different two corners. And that's why this hinge technique works. So it wouldn't work if you did it one, hit, one, hit one stud further over because then there wouldn't be enough space unless you made this wall be two studs thick and then you and then you would be able to so that's um, how that works now i'm going to talk about some of these uh, studs in all directions techniques that i showed earlier so this is an actual photograph with a tattoo on the uh the late uh, travis kunz who had this tattooed on his body um and it, this is the brick that he's famous for um it's we name it in his honor um, at least some of us call it the Travis Brick because of his, he used it a lot in his models. Um, and he, he died, I think in a motorcycle accident in the nineties. Um, the Lowell Sphere is another technique that's named for a builder. This one's named for Bruce Lowell. And in this um, scenario, you take these six panels that are shown here how to build them. And you take eight um, of the Travis Bricks and you uh, put them together, you can make a sphere out of them. Um, Brom Lombrecht uh, is another builder that uh, used to be a Valig member. I'm not sure if he still is. Um, uh, he designed a program that generates uh, instructions for making a ball of any diameter. And so if you look carefully at this, you can see a bunch of jumper plates uh, to represent the slopes um, here. Uh, with the this, this part here is sort of diagonal made out of jumper plates and this part is one stud difference made out of regular studs. Uh, if you want to try to incorporate some of the uh, techniques that we showed earlier for making a smooth um, transition, well that's left as an exercise to the builder. <laughs> but uh, this, this tool that he wrote, I think it's still online, uh, will generate a, a Eldra instructions and therefore you can import those into um, into studio, although you probably will have to add some plates to make it uh, hold together uh, when you do so. This is an old Lego Ideas project that was submitted in 2012. It only got 699 votes. Um, and it's not the one that Lego recently put out as a set, but this was built using the same kind of building technique um, as the uh, examples we just saw. 
Uh, and you don't have to use a Travis brick. You can use any snot parts. Here's an example using some other options. Um, but basically, you know, as long as you can fit it together, you can use it. Um, it the use of hollow studs is sometimes necessary in order to fit them into the, uh, the tubes on the bottom of, of the old style jumper plates. If you have the new style jumper plates, that's less of an issue. Uh, so some of my mocks that are based on these techniques, uh, the eyeballs of Kermit was actually the first time I ever used this technique. When I first saw it, I thought, oh, goodness, um, that would work really well for Kermit's eyes. Um, and then we also have some Christmas ornaments I've done, a sheep that we saw earlier, and my Easter eggs, which I built for Easter a few years ago. So here's how the eggs work. Um, it's basically a little sphere, except that I've made a few tweaks to some of the pieces. The bottom is the standard little sphere piece. Um, then the sides are slightly uh, elongated in the vertical direction. And then the top is a completely original uh, chunk that I designed. And so you can make a, an egg very easily by making these modifications to the little sphere. Um, and if you want to make an egg that's not white, um, then you might need to change the design around. Um, so this shows how if you put together um, pieces of different colors, you sometimes in order to get the colors to look right, you sometimes have to make some different choices about how things are built. And here's an example of how you might build a striped egg. So it is still fundamentally the same idea as the little sphere and the finished product looks identical. Um, but in order to make it work, you do have to make some design changes. So here's some other models. The Easter bunny that I built at the same time as those eggs um, is also built studs in all directions. And some of the other models I built too, um, the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, um, the Teddy Bear, they're all based around the same basic principle of studs in all directions. And highly encourage you to experiment with this technique because especially if you're doing larger figures, it makes it really um, realistic and leaving all the studs on makes it look furry. So I'm gonna finish the presentation with just a few uh, sort of random techniques I've picked up over the years that I thought were kind of cool. Uh, the first one is one that is, I'm not sure why it's called D-snot, but um, obviously snot for studs out on top. This is technically, I think, not a legal build because the pins on the sides of those hinge parts are not actually supposed to go into a hollow stub, but they do fit if you push hard. Um, and the nice thing about this is that you can pivot, you can still rotate the blue hinge parts um, in place. And of course the gray hinge part is, could be attached to other hinge pieces, or you could use the, like I've done on the other side with the yellow um, to attach it to uh, some studs. Um, in any case, this is an, another uh, really uh, interesting technique for how to use uh, the hinge part as a snot piece. Um, this is a surprise that uh, I saw somebody posted this on Facebook. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, manage to record who it was. But if you take the two by two brick with the fluted sides and place it at a 45 degree, it will actually fit over a stud and the cutouts will, will fit over the adjacent studs. And so, um, and that's, it doesn't work on the regular two by two round because if you look closely, at the fluting here, there's a little cutout on this one. And on the regular one, the cutout's a little bit smaller, so it doesn't have room for a whole stud that way. Um, but this, you notice this is a 45 degree axle connection relative to some studs. And 45 degree connections in Lego are not easy to come by. And so this is definitely worth noting. Um, here's another interesting uh, way of uh, connecting to some round pieces. If you turn, over, unfortunately, they don't make this part anymore, but the old style of two by two round tile or the round tile with the lifting ring has an X on the bottom. If you get one of the ones with an X on the bottom, that X nestles perfectly inside the um, underside of any one by one square piece, whether that be a one by one brick or plate or tile or whatever. Um, it is an illegal technique and it doesn't uh, have the right geometry for that stud to be connecting to other things. And of course it's a tile, so you don't have a stud on the other side. Um, and no, there isn't a version of the round uh, two by two jumper that works this way. Unfortunately, that part was newer, uh, nor is there a version of the donut hole uh, 
uh, what are the hole in the middle, just the regular tile um, or the one with lifting ring. Um, but one of the uses that I discovered, Zonker pointed this out to me actually, um, he had a two by two round tile that had like, I think it was a railroad crossing RXR uh, printed on it. And he used the clip piece that you see on the left there, the gray one, um, pushed it to the bottom of that tile to attach it to a pole. And that made a really nice little uh, way of doing a round uh, street sign. So if you wanna attach a round sign to something, that's a good way of doing it. It doesn't come in all that handy, but it is kind of a neat aspect of the geometry of these pieces. Another trick, which I don't uh, point out here, but I will just tell you verbally is, if you look at the way that that X is situated, you can actually lay a one by anything plate across the bottom of those in the center, such that the X goes between two studs. And um, there is enough room around the outside edge where, the, where these little uh, curved uh, walls are for the stud to fit in between this and the X. So that is how Kermit's eyes are attached. Um, Kermit's eyes are one of these in black attached to a one by two plate. Um, and then there's actually a pair of one by one tiles adjacent to it. And that's how I, that's how I did the eyes on Kermit. Um, so that approach, uh, that was actually the inspiration for the whole model was when I discovered that technique. I should probably make a slide for that idea, but I didn't. Um, so now we're to the point, any questions um, and anybody wants to ask, um, and if you don't want your voice recorded, uh, I'll stop the recording and you can ask it after that. But uh, if there are any questions and you don't mind um, recording, go ahead now. I don't hear anyone speaking. So I'm gonna say that's not, I do see in the chat, there are some messages, but it's just, I think it's just uh, thank yous and so forth. Um, any other questions? I guess not. All right. Um, so additional resources, uh, here are links to some of the things that we've seen in this presentation. Um, my website at the bottom is brick, brickpile.com. A copy of this will be available. So don't worry about panic, uh, writing these down in a panic. Um, and uh, just we'll have uh, a copy of these slides and a copy of the video available through my website, uh, brickpile.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to me by email, billatwords.net. Um, I am on the various social media platforms as shown here. And I welcome any questions, observations, or suggestions through any of those channels. So thank you very much for your time. And that concludes my presentation.